A famous scholar once wrote, Bustin makes me feel good. I believe that in these dark times, this statement has never held more true. Anyway, that's the end of that bit. Welcome to the video. Ghostbusters Afterlife, the fourth entry into the franchise, releases this week, so I felt it would be appropriate to take a look back at the heavily divisive third entry into the franchise, Ghostbusters Answer the Call. The original film from 1984 is a classic for a variety of reasons. Not only is it a genuinely funny film with a likeable and impressive cast, the world it creates with all the ghost busting technology is instantly recognizable and just super fun. It received a sequel, Ghostbusters 2, five years later, and while that movie still manages to be a good time, it is a major step down from the original. Not only does it take half the film for the team to reunite, but the primary villains of the film don't manage to have the same kind of compelling mystery surrounding them that Zool had. Are you the key master? Not that I know of. It's also just not as funny, but it is a solid entry that manages not to make any waves. Despite a long-running cartoon series, a third movie just never materialised, primarily due to Murray's reluctance to sign on for another film. Unfortunately, Harold Ramis, who played Egon in the originals, passed away in 2014. This effectively cancelled any talks of a third Ghostbusters, and so Sony decided instead to reboot the franchise in 2016. And so Ghostbusters was born, later rebranded as Ghostbusters Answer the Call, because Sony really don't want you to mistake this for the original. Directed by Paul Feig, who's most well known for films like Bridesmaids, Spy, and A Simple Favor. I'm not typically a fan of his work. The only one I've enjoyed so far has been A Simple Favor, and that's largely because I'm completely in love with Anna Kendrick and Henry Golding but I'm keeping an open mind. I don't think that Ghostbusters is some sacred text that should never be altered with. I am perfectly happy for this film to do things differently. Like, as long as they bust ghosts, that's about as close to the source material as they need to be. A tour of an old New York mansion introduces us to the world and comedy of the film. Zach Woods manages to be pretty funny here as the tour guide and I'm just gonna say it. This guy fucks, am I right? A pretty fun Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed feeling sequence follows, and after the title card, we're introduced to Kristen Wiig's Erin Gilbert, a professor up for tenure. She's left her ghost-searching past behind her, but a visitor drags her back into the world of the paranormal. She visits her old friend Abby, portrayed by McCarthy, who's currently working with McKinnon's Dr. Holtz, Aaron. Back. Fiona. Fiona. Mom. Abby. Harold. Donkey. Benny. They visit the mansion from the beginning, and it's here that we get our first ghost sighting of this cutie. <laughs> oh, Jesus. This metaphysical manifestation prompts the three of them to start their own business where they bust ghosts. We're quickly introduced to the main villain, who is incredibly one note, and honestly so basic they're barely worth mentioning. While everyone here is clearly trying their best, and seemingly having a ton of fun while telling this story, uh, all the performances are pretty one note. That's not inherently the fault of the actors, but more so the script for not giving these people places to really shine on an emotional front. They all manage to be funny, even if a lot of the jokes do fall flat, but they're not really given anything to chew on. They hire Chris Hemsworth's dopey Kevin, as their assistant, and after another ghost encounter, Leslie Jones's Patty joins the group. In typical Ghostbusters tradition, the black member of the group joins significantly later, is not a scientist, and gets way less development. A gargoyle-styled ghost at a rock concert leads to some pretty cool action and a few funny quips, despite an incredibly weird cameo by Ozzy Osbourne. Sharon! I think I'm having another flashback! Is this a good time, Doctor, or is this dinner rush? Oh look, Bill Murray is here! Casper! <laughs> 
Bill Murray is dead. Hey, that man went out the wrong door. Something I've noticed so far while watching the Blu-ray is that it has an almost 3D effect to the whole thing. While it's not present on the footage within this video, uh, for example, here's what a standard shot of the film may look like, and here is what the 3D version looks like. The effects often overlap the black bars on the top and bottom, making them appear to be coming out of the screen. It's a pretty cool way of doing this, and it certainly makes it a far more memorable experience. Anyway, the villain kills himself when he's cornered by the ghost extinguishers. Man, I really need to come up with a better name for them. Yeah, so, then the villain comes back, uh, takes control of Kevin's body, and begins the apocalypse. Of course, since this film can't move on from its past, it's cameo time! We've got Dan Aykroyd, Slimer, the State Puff Marshmallow Man. Wait, was that Milana Vaintrub? And the Logo Ghost? Oh, is this what you want? Something more familiar? No, do something new. Yes, the big bad at the end of this is the ghost from the Spectral Apparition Trapper's logo. There's a pretty cool fight scene where each member gets to have a standout moment, with Kate McKinnon's slow-mo shootout to a dramatic version of the theme tune as the best of the best. There's a lot of cool drama here, and it's a pretty fun, if emotionally flat, finale that concludes with yet another classic Ghostbusters cameo. And as it turns out, the film can't even get through the credits without another cameo. Ghostbusters Answer the Call has promise. It has a talented cast, a good director, and a property with plenty of room for exploration. Unfortunately, while the original was able to perfectly juggle its sci-fi and comedy elements, the all-female version goes all in on one or the other depending on the scene. And ultimately, that leaves the whole thing feeling disjointed. Yes, it's often funny, but a lot of the jokes manage to miss, and while the ghost-busting action feels exciting and fresh, there's not enough of it to save the film from mediocrity. It manages to remain a good time though, and there's certainly far worse ways to spend a couple hours. Is it as good as the original? Hell no. But everyone here gives it their best, and it's difficult not to be charmed by that. Thank you all so much for watching. Ghostbusters Afterlife is now in cinemas pretty much worldwide, so if you have any interest in seeing it, make sure to venture out to support your local cinema. Movies should be experienced together. Or secondhand, through some random guy's videos on YouTube. Next week, I'm not going to be looking at 2003's Daredevil. Get it? Because... Because he can't... Because he's blind. So... So he can't... He can't look, because he's, he's blind. New episodes of the show release every Saturday at 4pm BST, so make sure to hit subscribe if you want to stay tuned with all my upcoming videos. And of course, if you enjoyed, I'd very much appreciate if you could hit the like button down below and let our YouTube overlords know that uh, you like my content. Uh, but until next time, I hope you guys have a beautiful day and an even brighter tomorrow. See ya.